Hey, my name is Nico, and today I'm gonna do a giveaway and Q&A to celebrate 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. This video is not sponsored. All the stuff I'm giving away are things I've bought myself to use for making videos in the past year on YouTube, and now I'm giving those things away to you. There are five prizes you can choose to either win a Sky Adventurer Star Adventurer Pro Pack. This is a very nice Star Tracker setup, and the only reason I'm giving this one away is I bought a new one that has the Wi-Fi control, but this one works just as well. Honestly, the Wi-Fi is pretty unnecessary. I'm also giving away a stock Canon 60D with two lenses, uh, just a cheap zoom lens and a nifty 50 f1.8 prime lens. This is a great starter camera and lens, so you could just get a tripod and start shooting Orion Nebula with it. For the more experienced astrophotographers, I'm giving away three different two inch light pollution filters. We got the Optolong L Pro, the Astronomic CLS and the SV Boney CLS. The full details and rules for the giveaway are in the description. Uh, there's two links, but listen up right now for how to enter. Uh, to enter, you need to fill out the first link, the Google form that's linked right below in the description. That Google form is password protected. And the password is gonna be given out one letter or number at a time throughout this video, just like this in the corner. Uh, so the first letter in the password is capital N. Just open up a note app or some scratch paper and watch the video to get the full password. If you try to share the password in the comments, I will delete your comment. Please fill out the form in the next week for a chance to enter and you only get to enter to win one thing. So please pick what you will actually use. One thing to consider is I'm guessing there's gonna be less competition uh, to win a filter. So I'm just gonna, cause I'm, I'm just gonna pick randomly. So your odds are based on how many people enter the giveaway and pick that item. Um, so your odds will probably go down if you choose the star tracker. Okay, enough said about that. Let's answer uh, some of the questions you sent me. I got so many good questions, so I'm just gonna have to pick some. I'm gonna start with the question I got the most, and I think Mr. Kurtovsky summed it up well here. How did you get started with astrophotography? What were your first gear and results? And what were you struggling most at the beginning? Just give us a full Nico story. And I'm gonna tack on uh, one more question here, which is another common one I got, which is sort of what's your best beginner advice? Because I think it's related to all of this. Um, so let's start back at the beginning. I first got interested in the world of night photography in 2014. Uh, so seven years ago now, I was visiting Iceland in the winter with the hope of seeing the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. And at that time, I was really into time-lapse photography as a hobby. Here's some of my time-lapse shots from that trip. And I was, I was lucky enough to shoot the Aurora as a time-lapse too. And it wasn't until uh, months later that it occurred to me to actually edit a single photo from that time lapse. And when I was just playing around with that image in Photoshop, so this was like the spring of, of 2015 now, I found, wow, there's so much here if I just brighten up the photo and play around with it. And that was that light bulb moment for me that really got me hooked initially. So I stuck with wide angle stuff. I was using Canon 5D, rocking on lenses on a tripod for about a year. And I got some okay Milky Way shots like this. But eventually in my research about this, I stumbled on the deep sky astrophotography, which always intrigued me. And I was sort of hemming and hawing and delaying getting started because I wasn't sure I could afford it. I didn't want to buy a telescope right away. But I found um, you know, a tracker and that, that maybe I could do that. And in January of 2016, I got a used AstroTrack star tracker. And on my first night out in January, I got this picture of Orion and I was blown away. The fact that I could see those colors from the city, that was the moment where my mind was blown and I knew this hobby was what I was looking for. Since then, I've really spent almost all of my free time and money towards getting better and better at it. Um, in terms of what I was struggling most at the beginning, I'd say the new equipment rabbit hole. Basically, this is how this rabbit hole works. You, you go out, something isn't working, you become frustrated, you give up on imaging that night, you go online and some person trying to help from their experience says, oh, well, you just need this new gadget, auto guiding or whatever it is, and your, your problem will be solved. So you go buy some more equipment, you wait for another clear night, and even if that new gadget fixed your first problem, which it probably didn't, you now have a bunch of new problems and you still haven't produced any images. And so this is a pretty common experience for the deep sky astrophotographer, it's what happened to me. And my advice to get out of that rabbit hole is 
is not that we can never buy any new gear. Of course, the gear is fun, it's part of the hobby, but my advice is don't add anything new until you feel confident that you've mastered and reached the limit of what you have. So if you're having a problem, I always first try to solve it creatively with what you have. That's gonna allow you to build a good foundation for your astrophotography and teach you how to problem solve, which is way more valuable than owning a bunch of expensive equipment that you don't know how to use properly. Okay, astronaut yet asks, in some photos I see a few stars with a very spiky pattern while other stars in the same photo look like blobs. Is that an optical effect of the lens or telescope or can we deliberately achieve something like that? Answer to that is yes and yes. It is something that's caused by the telescope or lens, but you can also create them. They're called diffraction spikes, and they will appear on bright stars. Um, while they're also on dimmer stars, they're usually too dim to see. In the case of a Newtonian telescope like this one, they're caused by these spider veins holding in the secondary mirror. In the case of a camera lens, they only appear when you stop down the lens using the internal aperture blades because that that iris isn't perfectly round. Um, you won't see diffraction spikes on refractor telescopes typically or lenses when they are wide open, when the aperture is wide open. So if you want to create them in those cases, you can tape something really thin like dental floss or fishing line to the front of your lens or refractor telescope. Okay, Marco asks, how do you manage the change in sleep cycles when spending the nights outside? Well, me personally, not well. I'm I'm the kind of person who just stays out all night working the whole time on various setups and things for YouTube or uh, you know my personal astrophotography, and then I just lose out on that night's sleep. Or maybe I get home and I can get a couple of hours as the sun is rising. Um, I really want to get better at this now that I'm you know getting older and things, but with my style of in imaging, I'm just not sure realistically. I'll get that much better at getting more sleep until something really changes in my life, like I get an observatory in a dark sky or something like that, but not anytime soon. Okay, Toshal asks, I have a 60 millimeter refractor with an alt as mount, which I use for astrophotography along with my phone. If I wanna get better pictures, do I change my telescope or my camera? Uh, if so, any recommendations? So in this particular case, I'd recommend upgrading the camera first. I would recommend, you know, you can enter my giveaway, or you can buy, try to get a used Canon or Nikon DSLR uh, with a lens, and you can attach that to the Altaz mount to do some basic tracking, uh, you know, 20, 30 second exposures, and get much better deep sky photos that way. Um, phone cameras are getting better, but they're still very small sensors compared to a DSLR, and by shooting through the eyepiece also, because you have the lens on the phone, you're losing a lot of potential light compared to, uh, doing it other ways. Um, now, the caveat, if you already own a telescope and you're thinking of attaching a DSLR to it in what we call prime focus, that, not, that doesn't always work on cheap telescopes. So do a little bit of research on Google first. Some telescopes are really not designed to work with a camera in prime focus, especially Newtonians like this one often don't have enough inward travel on the focuser to reach focus with a DSLR. So before you buy a DSLR to work with your telescope, make sure it will work. Polman Wajtek asks, how do you take astro photos during winter time when it is like negative 10 degrees Celsius and snow, how to protect equipment? Is it necessary and is the settings different? Okay, so mostly it's the same and you get free camera cooling from the, the low temperatures, which always helps with noise, especially if you're using a DSLR or mirrorless camera. A couple tips I have is give yourself some extra time because everything takes longer in the snow and cold. You don't want to rush because uh, that's when you might make mistakes. Put on way more layers than you think is necessary. Like just really overdo it because when you're just sitting out there in the cold, not generating any body heat, you will get insanely cold. Um, all batteries, but especially in phones and laptops I've noticed, don't last as long, so be prepared for that. Extra batteries, external battery banks, anything like that. If setting up your tripod in the snow, I'd suggest bringing a shovel and digging out little holes in the snow for where the tripod feet go, um, because snow will com compress over time and it's just not very stable compared to solid ground. So I'd always dig out the snow and put your 
tripod on that. Another reason to do that, if I, I've had tripod feet come off in the snow and then they're basically impossible to find until the snow melts. Okay, JJ from Long Island, New York asks, do you have any suggestions for some wide field targets during galaxy season other than the more popular ones? For those that don't know, uh, galaxy season is roughly March through May in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but the problem is, and it just means when the Earth, you know, in the, we in the Northern Hemisphere have this good view of a lot of galaxies. But the problem is that most galaxies are very small, so they don't look that good in wide fields, like with a, a camera lens. And so my suggestion is to stay up late or wake up early and start shooting the many great wide fields in one of my favorite constellations, Cygnus, which rises surprisingly high even as early as March for us in here in the north. Uh, you just need to be up at the right time, which is around 3 a.m. or so, but that's my advice. Okay, Mihalo asks, why are you doing YouTube? Uh, basically just because I enjoy it, um, pretty much every aspect of it. I, I, most of all, it's I really like the feeling of helping other people, but also I have a lot of past experience with videography and editing, and I like those things. It's nice to keep those skills active and I hope to do more creative videos in the future. Okay, I know I only got to a very small percentage of the questions, but thank you very much if you submitted a question. I have saved all of them, and I'll be using them to help me generate new video ideas or just to incorporate them into future videos. Um, so hopefully your question will get answered eventually. Just keep watching this channel. Okay, this is the end of the video now, but remember to enter the giveaway. You should hopefully have the full password now and uh, subscribe to this channel if you haven't. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver from nebulaphotos.com. Clear skies.